Let's say it together. Through this word, I will grow. By this word, I will triumph. In this word is my future. This word is real life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Judges chapter 4. We're going to go to two places in Scripture today. Judges chapter 4 and 1 Samuel chapter 25. In Judges chapter 4, and I'm using my Good News Bible today, I'm going to begin in verse 4. Judges chapter 4, verse 4. The judges, this is during a time when there was no king in Israel. They had just recently settled the land, and the judges were raised up by God to make the important decisions and to lead the people and to lead the nation. So it's called Judges, and this is the history. This book is the history of that time period. Now, Deborah, the wife of Lapidot, was a prophet. No, number one, she's a woman and she's a prophet. God does not distinguish between male and female in the church, all right? If you have any church background where your women are not allowed to preach or teach or women are not allowed to speak, forget it. It is not scriptural. I don't care how big the denomination or how long it's been around. It's not according to God's word. We see right here that she is a prophet. She is a woman and she is a prophet. So how can she be silent? Now, you might say, well, they're not in the church. No, this is the foundation and the root of the church. Because Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. So this is the foundation of our faith. And she's a prophet. And it says she was serving as a judge for the Israelites at that time. She was also a judge. So she's making decisions that determine the direction of the people, both male and female. And the people are respecting her and mindful of what she decides. They're honoring her. She's a woman, and she's being honored as a leader. There is nothing wrong with this. This is God's word. And so it says that um, she would sit under a certain palm tree between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel would go there for her decisions. One day she sent for Barak, son of Avinoam, from the city of Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, has given you this command. Take 10,000 men from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them to Mount Tabor, or Har Tavor. I will bring Sisera, the commander of Yabin's army, to fight you at the Kishon River. He will have his chariots and soldiers, but I will give you victory over him. Barak replied, I'll only go if you go. If you don't go, I'm not going either. All right. Several things from those few short scriptures. We see that as a woman of influence, today's message is called Women of Influence. As a woman of influence, she stirred up Barak for military action. She stirred up Barak for military action when he wanted to defer. He was not too interested in doing this, and she is stirring him up to lead the army and to make this battle. There are times when women are needed to stir things up. Now, generally, guys are going to say, yeah, yeah, I know all about that. They generally do stir things up. However, that is part of their divine nature, to stir things up. How many times, guys, the toilet's not working, and, but you figure out if you just jiggle the handle, it works just fine. So you just go months and months jiggling the handle, but not for her. She doesn't want to jiggle the handle, and she insists on you fixing it. But you're saying in yourself, I just jiggle the handle. It's just fine. It's just a jiggly handle. But to her, the whole thing is breaking down. Now, when that just to you, it's a jiggling handle. To her, the entire house is going down the drain. Everything's falling apart. You, you, know, you, don't, you got to fix this because the whole house is going to fall down if you don't fix this handle. And eventually you get stirred up to fix it. Whether you want to be stirred up or not, you get stirred up. Now, that's a silly example. But as an influencer for the things of God, women can stir up people to serve God stronger and more and closer, to, to be a better believer and a better person. Women can stir up to do things that you don't necessarily want to do, even though you know it's better if you do do them. So we see that Deborah stirred Barak to action when he wanted to defer. Number two, she answered, all right, I'll go with you. But don't, you won't get any credit for the victory because the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah set off for Kadesh with Barak. Barak called the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and 10,000 men followed him, and Deborah went with him. The second thing that a woman of influence does is exhort, she exhorted Barak to trust the Lord, 
though he was going to be facing overwhelming odds. Women of influence exhort their families, exhort others to trust God in the face of overwhelming odds. Those overwhelming odds may not be an army of Sisera. It may be an army of debt. It may be an army of bad news, an army of troubles. It may be an army of symptoms, whatever it is that is overwhelming, whatever it is that the odds are against us. A woman of influence will influence people, exhort them to take the battle and trust God, to go into battle and trust God, to trust God and overcome that sickness, to trust God and overcome that debt, to trust God and see him act and see him move in your lives. Then the other thing about this is that she said, all right, the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hand of a woman, but she was not referring to her own hand. A woman of influence will advance the success of others rather than self. A woman of influence will advance the success of others rather than self. Now this can be in a very simple way. Um, you know, I'll just give you some examples from our family. Uh, Pastor Mary Beth called the kids in one at a time over the, you know, like a, a month and a half, two months ago, and said, you know, I, I saw this or I heard this and you might want to check this out as far as jobs. And they all got these jobs, dream jobs for each one of them. Just the kind of thing that they wanted. And so she, this was not for her success, but the success of others. Uh, when I was little, I can remember one of the, the early memories I have of being really young and uh, my mother taking my sister and myself. And so uh, she's taking us out into the Pine Barrens of southern New Jersey. And we were looking for something called Quaker Bridge. There was a bridge out there that was from, you know, the time of the revolution. And it was still there somewhere. And it was on this sandy road in the middle of the pines. There's no roads out to it. And we went time after time after time trying to find this Quaker Bridge. And it was called Quaker Bridge from, I guess, from the Winter Quakers were there. And so I remember one time we actually found it. And we found the bridge. It was just a, you know, wooden, old wooden bridge, but it was pretty picturesque and scenic. And it's in the middle of nowhere. I'm talking these roads, they're not paved, they're not scraped, they're just full of potholes. And if you go in the wet weather, you're gonna, your car is going to get in the water and sink in the water. This was dry, but that was also a problem because when we got out there, we got stuck. We are far, miles from anywhere. And um, the, the tires were just spinning in the soft sand, you know, and just spinning and spinning and spinning. And the more they're spinning, the deeper the car is going down. It was a, these were, this was back in the, I don't know, 60s, late 50s, early 60s. And we're just sinking down. And there's nobody going to come out there. We're in the middle of nowhere. And so uh, she said to us, to my sister and I, get out of the car. So we get out of the car, and she says, now I want you to sit on the fender, the back fender, over the, type, over the tires, you know, right where they're in the hole. And so we're, what? So we get out, and we're sitting on the outside of the car. This is a great thrill to us, because never have we been allowed to sit on the outside of the car while she's driving the car. But she's not really driving, just spinning the wheels. But the extra weight caused the wheel to get some traction, and we got out of that hole. Now, you might say, well, you know, how did that influence you? Well, it wasn't that I remember that part because that was kind of funny, but it was the searching for Quaker Bridge. Later on, I become an archaeologist. This is an influencer. This is an influencer for someone else's success and not necessarily their own, although she was successful. She found Quaker Bridge. All right. Now, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. We're going to talk about Abigail. 1 Samuel. I don't think I've, I've uh, mentioned Abigail in years 1 Samuel chapter 25, go with me, and verse 14. Now, let me just, before we start, uh, David had sent word to a wealthy guy there named Nabal, and he said, look, we've been along your flocks, we've been with your, your shepherds, we haven't harmed anybody, we haven't taken anything, we haven't raided your fields and taken any food, can you please help us? We're in need, can you help us? And Nabal basically insulted him and said some you know, pretty ugly things to him, and, um, and said, I'm not going to help you at all. And he called him a slave and called him a runaway slave and all kinds of, of things like that. It really put him down. So one of Nabal's servants said to, to Nabal's wife, Abigail, have you heard David sent some messengers from the wilderness with greetings for our master, but he insulted them. Yet they were very good to us. They never bothered us. And all the time we were with them in the fields, nothing that belonged to us was stolen. They protected us day and night the whole time we were with them looking after our flocks. Please think this over and decide what to do. This could be disastrous for our master and all his family. He is so mean that he won't listen to anybody. Abigail quickly gathered 200 loaves of bread, two leather bags full of wine, 
five roasted sheep, two bushels of roasted grain, a hundred bunches of raisins, and 200 cakes of dried figs, and loaded them on donkeys. Then she said to her servants, you go on ahead and I'll follow you. She didn't say anything to, uh, by the way, to Nabal. She was riding her donkey around a bend on a hillside when suddenly she met David and his men coming toward her. David had been thinking, why did I ever protect that fellow's property out here in the wilderness? Not a thing that belonged to him was stolen, and this is how he pays me back for the help I gave him. May God strike me dead if I don't kill every last one of those men before tomorrow morning. So David, you got a picture of David. David was just minding his own business, driving on interstate, following the laws, using his signals, and some idiot comes and nearly runs him off the road, cuts him off, and David is going to get him. Before sunrise, he's going to, if he has to chase him for 20 miles, he's going to show him. She was riding her donkey. When Abigail saw David, she quickly dismounted, threw herself to the ground at David's feet and said to him, please, sir, listen to me. Let me take the blame. Please don't pay any attention to Nabal, that good for nothing. Okay, now, ladies, that's not such a good thing. But, you know, she was just married to a guy who wasn't in church. Um, yeah, I mean... Yeah, basically. He is exactly what his name means, a fool. I wasn't there when your servants arrived, sir. It is the Lord who kept you from taking revenge and killing your enemies. And now I swear to you by the living God that your enemies and all who want to harm you will be punished like Nabal. Please accept this present I have brought you. Give it to your men. Please forgive me for any wrongdoing. The Lord will make you king and your descendants also, because you are fighting his battles, and you will not do anything evil as long as you live. If anyone should attack you and try to kill you, the Lord your God will keep you safe as someone guards a precious treasure. Okay, and she goes on from there. So let's, let's analyze this. The first thing we see about, uh, about Abigail, she is sharp-minded. She is quick-witted. She immediately devises a plan that is going to keep everyone from coming to harm. Now, um, this little might be not quite the same level as that, but um, I don't know, about a year or so ago, Anatoly got a new razor, a little electric razor and trimmer, and he comes rushing into my bathroom early in the morning as I'm getting ready, and he only has half a mustache. And uh, he said, Papa, Papa, what do I do? I slipped. And he's got... I said, well, you got two choices. You can either shave the other side off and have none, or you can go see Mama and see what she can do about it. And so he goes in and shows her half a mustache, and she immediately pulls out a pencil, you know, a, a, an eyebrow pencil, and she colors in the other side, and you can barely tell that it, was, that it was only half a mustache. Quick thinking. Women of influence are quick thinking. Women of influence come up with a plan. Women of influence decide what to do to remedy a situation without bringing people to harm. The second thing we see there is she spoke with wisdom and diplomacy. She spoke with wisdom and diplomacy. Women of God speak with wisdom, and here's a new one, diplomacy. Diplomacy. This is something lacking in our society today, diplomacy. We need to really sharpen our diplomatic skills that we can encourage rather than put down, that we can point out the positive rather than the negative, that we can bring two sides together rather than further apart. An influencer will bring two warring parties to the table and bring them to a place where they will negotiate one with another. An influencer will not insult them all so they all go on their way and continue to war against each other, an influencer will not just pacify one side and negate, neglect the other. An influencer will bring them together. An influencer will bring family members together. An influencer will bring neighbors together. An influencer will bring coworkers together. Maybe you're in a circumstance at work where there are two people that can't stand each other. You like both of them. They both like you. you. They can't stand each other. An influencer will slowly, slowly begin to bring them together so that there will be harmony rather than any kind of warfare on the job. So a woman of influence will speak with wisdom. Wisdom comes from God. If any lack wisdom, let him ask, and God will give liberally. And they'll speak with diplomacy. The, the third thing I want to show you about Abigail, she had ample supply. Ample supply. A woman of influence will always have what is needed, not just what she needs, 
what is needed when it's needed. Guys, have you ever looked in your wife's purse? Have you ever seen what's in there? I mean, if we need a beach umbrella, she's probably got one in there. Our kids know that she is a walking pharmacy. If you need a Band-Aid, she's got it. If you need, you know, some poison ivy spray, she's got it. If you need sunscreen, she's got it. If you need a hat, she's probably got that. A sun hat. The purse. I, don't, I, I've, I have noticed that over the years of marriage, the purse gets bigger. And uh, always, what, and I, literally, our kids know that whatever you need, she, she, if you need something to eat, she's probably got it. If you need something to drink, she's probably got it. I'm telling you, every need is supplied by that purse, according to our riches and glory by Christ Jesus. <laughs> Ample supply. Now, women of influence don't just have ample supply in their purse, but they have ample supply in their heart. That what somebody needs emotionally, what somebody needs spiritually, what somebody needs intellectually, someone needs guidance, someone needs purpose or direction, <clears throat> there's an ample supply in the heart to freely give what's necessary and needed. Women of influence like Abigail, she was prepared. Women of influence are prepared prepared to give, prepared to receive, prepared to supply. It's not like, you know, Pastor Mary Beth packs her purse. Okay, we're going to the beach today. I'll need the beach umbrella. I'll need water bottles. I'll need this. I need, no, it's always there. I'm joking about the beach umbrella, but it's always there. It's probably, there's probably a beach chair in there, though, you know, those folding chairs, but it's always there. Everything, it's not like each day she packs in that purse what's necessary for the day. That stuff is with her 24-7. And everybody knows it. So if you're out, if you're out somewhere and you have this desperate need, you cut your finger, you need a bandaid, you go, she's got it. Now, I don't, now guys, any of you carry band-aids in your wallet? I mean, do you, you know, I, I carry a wallet. I don't have a band-aid in it. I wouldn't even think of putting a band-aid in it. I mean, I wouldn't, that would not even cross my mind. You cut yourself, you get a napkin. You know, you stick it on there and you're good to go. What's with a, na what's with a band-aid in your wallet? But ladies of influence, they have not a Band-Aid, they've got a box of Band-Aids in there. And they probably have disinfectant, and they probably have bacterial, antibacterial, and they probably, right? Ladies, let me, let me ask you, you have any antibacterial in your purse? Any ladies have a little antibacterial? Of course you do. You're, you're a woman of influence, you are ready, you are prepared. Let me ask this lady, of all our ladies, ladies, in your purse right now, are there any things that you do not essentially need today, but they're in your purse anyway, in just in case, just in case you may need them. Yes, of course. Now let me ask you guys, guys, is there anything in your pocket or your wallet that you really don't, you're not going to probably not need today, but you just put them in there just, you know, because you might need them someday? No. What guy does that? We just have this little space here, a little space. A lot of guys have it back here. I keep mine here or here. You just have this little space here, your wallet. Have you ever noticed that men's wallets, they just open and close? Ladies' wallets, you unzip them, you open them up, and there's 16 <laughs> things that open up. It's like an accordion file. Marketers know how to market women of influence. They provide them. It's actually, they're enablers. Right? Marketers are enabling this in women. They say, we know they're going to carry a lot of stuff. Let's make the purse as big as a suitcase. Let's put all these divisions. In. Let's, let's make a wallet so it folds out like an accordion and they can put all this stuff in there and still can't close it. Put a rubber band around it to keep it closed. Even though it's got a snap, and it's got a buckle. They know you can't survive with just a fold. They know they've got to put a snap on. And then the snap keeps up, so they put a buckle. And they know you're going to have to have rubber bands even with the snap and the buckle because you're still going to put so much in it. But that's a woman of influence. You're prepared. You notice how much Abigail took? She didn't say, hey, let's get, you know, let's get a couple sandwiches. Let's get a couple burgers. She says, look at, look at what she's taking. She's taking, let me go back to where there was, 200 loaves of bread. Which one of you has 200 loaves of bread in your purse? I mean, this lady had a big purse. And there, oh, she had two purses, two leather bags full of wine. Okay, now, 
you know, we're talking about skins, so that's why they're leather bags. But I'm like, you're all carrying around leather bags today. Uh, five roasted sheep. Okay, we're getting down to it. Five sheep. She was prepared. I, now, personally, I don't know any ladies who carry even one sheep in their purse. But she had five. Two bushels of roasted grain. A hundred bunches of raisins. Anybody have raisinets in their purse? Any, any ladies have, honestly, any ladies have raisinets in their purse today? Because you're, you're a modern day Abigail if you have raisinets in your purse. They may be chocolate covered, but they're raisins nonetheless. No, okay. 200 cakes of dried figs. I like figs. Loaded them on her donkeys. All right. The lady was well prepared. She had more than enough. She didn't have just enough. She didn't have one half of one used Band-Aid. She's got a box of Band-Aids. She doesn't have one. Oh, oh, here's another one. You got a little sniffly nose. You sneeze or something. Guys, okay, in the old days, we would have a handkerchief in our pockets. Most guys, we've done away with handkerchiefs, right? You've done away with those. You, you look around, again, for the napkin. Find a napkin. You know, you, the one that you're using on your cut finger, that'll work too. You know, blow your nose and then put it back on your finger or whatever. It's the napkin. <laughs> ladies, ladies, in their purse, they have maybe not the box of Kleenex, but they've got... 15 of those little packs, not just one. There's not just one tissue in there. No, you've got the pack. And then you've got three or four more packs because you never know when you're going to run out of that one pack, so you better be prepared. More than enough. This is a woman of influence who has a tissue when you see, I mean, you're a complete stranger because here, you're, you're getting in. I heard you sneeze. Here's the tissue. Women of influence. You are prepared. You've got what you need emotionally. You're not going to break down. You're not going to break down at the first crack. You are going to stand strong because you have the emotional storehouse to weather the storm. You have the spiritual storehouse. You are prepared spiritually. You've got the scripture. Now, my kids, okay, we've homeschooled. We have still one in school. We've homeschooled. So they know that when they're sick, if they, if they wake up sick, they're not going to get out of school because they're not going to get out of home, right? What are we going to do? Send them to school because they're sick? You know, when, you, when your kids go to a school, you keep them home because they're sick. So, and they know this, that when they, if they say to us, oh, I'm not feeling so well, they're going to get a prayer. Hands laid on them and pull them up out of bed. Isn't that right? And they complain about that to us. They say, other kids, they get to sleep in. They get, when they're not feeling well, they stay home from school. When we're not feeling well, you pray over us, you lay hands on us, and you get us up. You see, a spiritual storehouse means you don't baby, you encourage. You encourage with the word of God. You encourage with prayer. You encourage with the anointing. You raise them up in the admonition of the Lord. Train them up in the way that they should go. Now, this does not just mean your personal children. It means anybody in your life. Anybody who looks up to you is a spiritual child. Any, whether they're an adult or not, they might have just gotten saved, they're a spiritual child. And they look up to you as a woman of God. So you lead them by demonstration, not just by words. Right? You don't just tell them what to do, you demonstrate what to do. You don't just tell them how they should be, you live it. You live the word of God. You live. Abigail lived the presence of God. She took the blame on herself. She said, forgive me. She's talking about her husband. She's interceding for her husband, she's taking the place. Yeah. And nothing happened to her. In fact, she became a wife of the king. The other guy died and she became his wife. He became David's wife. So she was she went from being a wealthy landowner to being the wife of a king, king of Israel. So it is absolutely time that our ladies see that God has a special call upon you, a special anointing upon you, and all the little idiosyncrasies, I didn't say idiot, I said idiosyncrasies, all those things about women are put there by God for a purpose. Now, one last thing about influence, you have great power to influence for positive or negative. You have great power to build up or put down. You have great power to bring joy or bring depression. I simply show you Eve who influenced Adam, and we, we, we have the result. 
So make sure that you use your influence by the Spirit of God. You have a unique position in God's creation to influence not only other women, but men, and to influence them with positivity and joy, to influence them with the presence of God, the power of God, to influence them with a spiritual storehouse and emotional storehouse. And that's what God is expecting, and that's why God created you. Because guys don't have it. Don't have any of that. Guys, when God created men, they're from dirt. <laughs> guys are dirt. Plain and simple. If it weren't for the Spirit of God being breathed into the dirt, there'd still be dirt. But women, you weren't made out of dirt. You were made out of flesh. So you have some stuff that guys don't have. And God wants to use it to influence our society, our culture. You're in a unique position because right now, women are, the society, the culture is calling upon women to influence. Yielding, men are yielding position to women to influence. Wanting women of influence. Let's make sure it's Christian influence. Powerful influence. Spirit of God influence. And not worldly, godless, societal influence. Rise up as Abigail and take charge of the situation. Rise up as Deborah and take charge of the situation because God has a special anointing for you right here, right now to do just that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.